today is all going to be about the Crusader. And this one I'm going to have a little more fluff to because personally the Crusader is one of my favorite classes in Darkest Dungeon. He may not be the greatest in all situations, however I do think he's very good in a key couple ones. And we'll talk about which ways you can take him. There is a thing such as the Support Crusader and there's obviously the Damage Crusader which many of us probably know much better than the Support Crusader. Obviously one of the soul crushers of unholy based enemies as you will see his skills significantly increase based upon the fact if they are unholy he does come with a stun and he can always support the party out through some minor healing and some decent stress healing if you decide to work towards it. For his background, battle hardened and stalwart, the crusader has held the front lines in a hundred holy wars. He either attacks foes head on with righteous fury or embraces a melee support role by leveraging his powerful defensive buffs and off heals. Pretty darn sweet and to the point. Absolutely, the Crusader is often most effective in positions 1 and 2, however he can function in positions 3 to 4 and play around the 2 and 3 strategy if you decide to do a party that moves around a lot based on the skills of other individuals. We'll talk about which kind of individuals he can pair well with in his ability Holy Lance, and maybe one you'll just want him to be a solid rock in your party and heal. Before we continue, once again we always need to judge the base damage, base dodge, HP and all of that. The Crusader wears heavy plate mail and wields a longsword. While affording him excellent protection and damage, his armor restricts movement and his sword cannot be swung effectively in the back ranks. I've just started reading these and I find it very interesting that this one actually kind of gives a reason why his skills are the way they are. He has low speed, which obviously is told by his armor, and his sword indeed can only hit the first two rows. So I just find it interesting that he has a lot of HP but doesn't have a lot of speed and they kind of hint towards that in the stuff, so that's, that's very interesting. The Long Crusade is his max out weapon. 10 to 19 damage is very good, something that uh, is probably one of the higher ones in the game. Crit base is not the highest at 7%, but not too low. Now the speed of 3 is exactly what they were talking about. He can't really move that well, so he's probably going to go last unless you put trinkets on him, quirks, battle ballad, I mean stuff to really obviously jack up his speed. His armor being Zealous Conviction. Dodge base of 25, not the highest, but an HP of 61 is very high, he's obviously looking towards that tank roll, so any trinkets that increases HP or protection can definitely increase that even more than it is already. Smite. Smite is his standard ability, and before we get too much into it, we always just want to talk about the row versatility, it's very important, and here you can see the weapon description actually comes into play. You can only hit positions 1 to 2 on their side, and you can only swing on positions 1 and 2 on your side. It does have an average accuracy of 105. It does only have a 4% critical modifier, which only bumps you up to 11%. It's not the highest. Obviously, you can increase that through other means, but just on the base alone, plus the crit chance, it's 11%. Now, obviously, where Smite becomes very good is the 35% damage against Unholy, thus why he can be good against certain bosses and obviously the ruins with skeletons. Ghouls are also Unholy, so he can get some extra damage to work through that protection. Ultimately, without any other damage items, this will take him to about, I believe, 14 to 26, which is a very good hit, and 105 is 10 more accuracy than the Leper, and that's about comparable damage to the Leper if you are swinging at Unholy-based enemies. There's not too much more to say about Smite other than it's very good. Now, the only problem is you can occasionally run into high protection-based enemies that will take away most of this bonus damage, and you'll probably be swinging between 10 to 19 anyways, but it at least allows you to pick someone who's non-DOT, but can still work through protection, pre-shield breaker, and if you don't want to use protection debuffs or pick to the face on the Grave Wrapper. Zealous Accusation Once again, same exact row versatility, 1 to 2 on your side, but this does hit both front rows, and that can have really good results. And usually, I use this on weaker enemies like spiders and bone militia. What this is also really good for is hitting the person in front still while maybe clearing a body in the second position. Or maybe you have two bodies in the second position and you can use this to clear both. It does have an accuracy of 105, which is average, just like Smite. Now obviously it does have a 40% damage modification. Without damage increasing, you are looking about 6 to 13 with some damage modifications. You can easily jack that up to maybe 7, 8 to 15. Obviously a critical then is putting out 22%, but you will notice there is no critical modifier on this as well. Therefore your chance of critting is lower if you don't actively work towards crit modifiers. And also what's very important is this is actually a ranged attack, it is not melee. 
Therefore, if you have accuracy trinkets, damage trinkets for melee, this is not going to get buffed at all. Just keep that in mind if Zealous Accusation is going to be a staple in your lineup. Stunning Blow. Accuracy of 110, and just like the last two abilities, 1 and 2, 1 and 2. That's a pretty good accuracy, 110, but it is a stun. Therefore, you are losing 50% more damage. You do get some crit modifier back, though, at a 4%, so you are around that 11% again. And 140% chance is an average stun chance. This is very good, though. I often keep on stunning blow, because positions 1 to 2 are often individuals who guard, or can be high damage dealers. Therefore, if they're not unholy, a 140% chance for minus 50%, that's still a nice 5 to 9 damage if you don't have any damage increased items on him. Also, you can't complain too hard about 110 accuracy, therefore, he's pretty tanky, has a stun, and 140% base is pretty good, and it can hit on key individuals guarding the back row individuals, or obviously someone like a Pelagic Piranha, who can hit very hard, so you can stun one rather reliably because they don't have the highest stun protection, and you can still do a decent amount of damage if you get a critical. Bulwark of Faith This one's very interesting, and it's used in the first two positions as almost all these abilities are going to be. The last three actually change in row versatility, but these first four have been very frontline and center, damage or control. This takes an interesting turn, because this takes it from damage and control more to like, you know what, I accept the fact I'm wearing full plate mail, I have 60 HP, I'm going to light up this room with plus 24 torch, that's amazing, that's a quarter. So if you're running low on torch, or if you don't want to use a torch, boom, you bulwark to essentially 25 torch. You're probably in the radiant light level now. That means extra damage and crits go away. You mark yourself, therefore people like cultist brawlers, anyone else who functions off of mark, such as the crawlers and the weld as well, will now target you, and you also get 30% protection. Thus, the light level goes up, which usually means enemy damage goes down along with stress. You mark yourself, which means you can probably gravitate a couple attacks towards this guy, and suddenly you have 30% more protection. If you have a hard skin quirk, that's 10%, and if you give him a trinket for 10 or, you know, 15, 20, however much, you can easily be at 50% protection within one turn and have everyone focus him. It's an amazing ability. You can essentially make his 60 into 90 HP in one turn if you have the right quirk and trinket on. I personally am not a huge Bulwark fan, however there's definitely a use for it if you like someone that's not the Man at Arms because you could Bulwark and then still do a lot of damage with Smite, Zealous Accusation, Stunning Blow. Bulwark doesn't really make him a non-damage character, you can just easily use this and then suddenly he has this for a battle, so it's really good. Battle Heal Alright guys, uh, stay with me as I read through this ability here, I don't want to fry your brains too much. Uh, heals 5 to 6. Okay, we're done. Um, no, all kidding aside, Battle Heal, it's not its not a terrible ability, but it's most definitely not a strong, strong heal. It's pretty good. There is a Crimson Court set that really helps bump that up a little bit, but if you don't have the Crimson Court DLC, you are going to be looking at trying to jack that up with a couple of other trinkets. There's some ancestral items that really help, and there's some common trinkets that do increase healing skills as well. However, I would not really rely on this as a main heal like a Vestal heal, but it can become a respectable heal, probably ranging between maybe 7 to 9, depending on how much you want to jack it up. But with just the natural 5 to 6, it's more of a mid-range heal now, which what you can do is you can try to pair it with other people who increase healing on them, there are trinkets that also increase healing, so if you know one person is going to take damage specifically, like let's say you have a man at arms and they're going to like guard for people you know he's going to be the main target, you can put the 40% healing on them, and then if he has a healing increase trinket, you can probably get it up to respectable, maybe like 9 to 11, I'm not sure on that math. But you could increase this to be better, but I would not rely on this as a really good heal to bail you out of bad situations. But it is a small heal. That if you want to use on the side, because it can be used in any row. Therefore, you can have this on a 1 to 2 Crusader and have him heal anybody on the team. So it's it, it can be a jail out of free card. That's not like just 1 HP like other characters do. It's not my favorite ability, but it's definitely a viable option if you like to support Crusader. And obviously this is an ability you would have on a support Crusader because it can be used in any position. Holy Lance. Now this is where we get... Probably his most interesting ability may be Inspiring Cry right after this. 
but we are looking at a third and fourth position use, which is polar opposite of pretty much the first four abilities we looked at. And the great thing about this ability is it can actually hit fourth, third, and second, which are high priority targets, second not so much, but third and fourth, absolutely. So what you can do, if you really like to, is start the Crusader in the third position, and then by the time it gets to his turn, which will be closer to the end, you can at least hit the third or fourth position. If you're lucky, you get a surprise and you can do it immediately. Now this does count a melee, despite the fact it is third and fourth position, you are whacking people with your sword like a lance, so don't be confused with that. It moves you forward one, which will naturally kick you out. If it's in third position, you'll go to second then. You can't reuse it, but if you want to use it twice, you can go fourth to the third, and then third to second. Accuracy is 105, which is, once again, average. The only ability that really goes up and beyond average is the Stunning Blow, and it's only 110. Therefore, putting items on that increases the Crusader's accuracy is going to be very beneficial, or pairing him with compositions that increases accuracy will be very beneficial. Now this is the really cool thing, that 10.5% critical modifier, I'm just going to round it up to 11 to make it easy, that is 18% critical, that's really good and any other critical buffs or modifiers can easily get this to like a 25-30% chance to critical, and then once again we dump on that 35% damage versus unholy. So the general idea is to act like a smite, but for positions 2, 3, and 4, which is really good and it pretty much trumps smite in the fact that yes, you can hit positions 2, 3, and 4 for the same ability. Often you would want that, but it does rely on that positioning. Now I'm going to talk about possible compositions you can do with this, that you can just pretty much do a continuous smite. Since the Crusader is slower, and if you do want to do the continual smites, here's what I've done in the past. I have loved to pair the Highwaymen and the Crusader together. Highwaymen, third position, because he has a much higher natural speed. Crusader, second position because the Crusader is not going to be the Highwayman, so you repost with the Highwayman, and then you Holy Lance with the Crusader. Now that will force you to just keep reposting with the Highwayman, and if you're not cool with that, you're going to have to understand the fact you can only do the Holy Lance every other turn, because first turn you can repost, then Holy Lance kicking the Highwayman back to the third position. Now if you Pistol Shot or whatever Grape Shot Blast, you are going to have to do something the first two rows with the Crusader, which is fine. You can easily do a Holy Lance into like a Smite or Stunning Blow, and then next turn do the same thing again. So you can do that, just be aware of it, that if you want the continuous turnout, you are going to have to just keep reposting. Other people who might be able to set him up is someone like a Grave Robber. You can lunge immediately, once again push him to the third position, then he can Holy Lance. Now that's a more of a one-time thing. But it can at least still work kind of twice because if you put the Grave Robber in fourth position, you can lunge to second, kicking him to third. And then when he Holy Lances, he kicks the Grave Robber to third, which he can then lunge, which would then kick him back one more time. But that would be the last time it works. But at least it would be two Holy Lances, two lunges. It would be pretty good row versatility and damage. It's something to keep in mind. Inspiring Cry. This one's a really cool ability. It's just got a little bit of everything. This is really nice for the end of fight situations where you're like, you know what, I got a turn or two left. I don't need the Crusader to like smack someone down. I got enough control, I got enough DOT, whatever have you. You know you're going to win the fight in a round or two. This is when an inspiring cry can really come into play. So what happens? You heal two for two. It's good to get people off Death's Door, but Battle Heal is obviously better. If you get a critical and you have some other stuff on, you might be able to get to like a 5 or 6, but for the most part you're going to be obviously sitting at a solid 2. Minus 8 stress is pretty good, it's almost minus 10, and, if you, and we are going to talk about maybe putting trinkets on them to increase stress skills and all of that. You could easily get that to minus 10 stress, which is really good, I mean that's 1 20th of the total stress pool. And it could also be a fifth of their stress, so they're sitting at 50, so it's, it's something you really can't disregard. And something you actually should not overlook is the fact it gives 10 torch. The Crusader is one of the few individuals who really adds to the torch level. And 10 torch will help you once again work towards that radiant light, which saves you torches, saves you possibly future stress, and obviously keeps you into the radiant level, which helps the scouting and all of that. Therefore, we really need to be aware of the torch level, and the fact that the Crusader is the beacon of light for your party in terms of protection, smiting the unholy, and obviously keeping things literally lit around you in light. Inspiring Cry can be used in any position, so once again, a great support ability on him. 
It can get buffed up by heal skills, stress skills, and also keeps the torch. I think Inspiring Cry is one of his stronger abilities, and I'll often keep this on him as a first row crusader. I'll have like Smite on, Zealous Accusation, Stunning Blow, and Inspiring Cry, because then it can help anyone else minus that stress heal while he still takes the brunt of damage because of his natural high HP pool at all points in the game. Because I love the Crusader, and uh, his skills are more simple, I did work through that a little quicker, so I did grab in one more trinket than normal. Now the trinkets I have up here, I don't want to say are unconventional, but they're a little different. I believe there's a lot of obvious trinkets to put on. Anything that increases accuracy is a top notch, anything that increases speed is another. I don't think the Crusader needs too many things that do increase in damage, and I sound hypocritical because the three trinkets I have up here do increase damage, but they also do other stuff for him other than just increasing damage, except for the Unholy Slayer Ring, but we'll talk about that. Crescendo Box. 2 speed, 15% damage. As I just said, usually you want to do things that make up. Well, he has a speed of 3, and this goes to a speed of 5. That can make him comparable to other enemies finally, therefore, he can at least not go last most times, and he does get that little bit of extra damage boost against enemies who aren't unholy, because face it, we're not always going to be fighting enemies that aren't unholy. So even that extra 15% damage can push him to about maybe 11 to 12 to 21, and that's really good. 12 to 21, with an accuracy of 105, we'll take that. It's very good. The Crescendo box is pretty much good on anybody, but I wanted to mention it on the Crusader, because I've used it many a times, and it does make the Crusader much, much better. This is a much lower level tier trinket, but I think it's really good and it should get an honorable mention because most times we're going to put the Crusader in positions 1 to 2 and an early plus 20% stun skill chance for only minus 2 dodge. He doesn't have a lot of dodge already, so minusing another 2 is really not going to do anything and minusing 2 dodge for most people isn't going to be the end of the world, but giving someone the ability to do 20% more stun skill chance I think is absolutely a must. I almost always put this on if I find it in the early game, because what's better than getting plus 20% stun skill chance for only minus 2 dodge? I mean, there's not a lot of trinkets that give you that much stun skill chance for such a small, small negative defect. Therefore, I think the Paralyzer's Crest is an absolute necessary on the Crusader in the early game, and you can even use this into the late game if you use him as a primary stunner. Suddenly, he's a 160% chance. Without a critical, with a critical, that can go to 180. You can almost stun anybody at that point in the game, and he'd be a great control factor for such an easy item to get. I will admit, this is kind of my cheese trinket. You don't really need more unholy damage, but what's better than more unholy damage against unholy? I just love it. It just really makes him a soul crusher for anything unholy. It can really help make up for the lack of the ability of Zealous Accusation because it does negate some of that minus 40% damage reduction. It's not only 15% now, the way math works on skin. It can help on a Holy Lance. I mean, you can really start building up a lot of damage. Criticals can start ranging to like 40 to 50. It's really good. I think the Unholy Slayer Ring is just a fun extra damage item on the Crusader for specifically the runes. Or if you fight a certain boss in the Cove, I don't want to say it by name, but there is a certain boss that is also unholy, and the unholy Slayer's Ring can make quick work of that boss as well. Now we get to the Sun Ring. Once again, it's another damage increase on him, but I was trying to pick items that were somewhat less obvious, because any items that increases the guy's HP, bleed, resist, if you're going to make him a support, anything that increases stress skills, or he has healing skills, are obviously things you want to work towards. I wanted to pick out items that you could put on if you're in a pinch or if you're in the uh, early to late game. So the Unholy Slayer Ring, the Sun Ring are more mid game, obviously the Crescendo Box depending on your luck could be late, early, whatever. Once again it's mostly luck based, but the Paralyzer's Charm is mostly early. But the Sun Ring can kind of address two things, once again that general damage against enemies who aren't unholy and that 5 accuracy really does just give him that 110 on most of his abilities and then 115 on his stun chance. If you were to pair that with the Paralyzer's Crest, suddenly, you know, that's 115 accuracy. That's pretty good. Even 30 dodges are clicking at an 85%, and you'll take an 85%. For his campfire abilities, Righteousness and Conviction inspire compelling speeches around the campfire. In the face of mounting stress, the Crusader is a leader, standing tall and refusing to break. His unshakable belief can assuage companions' fears, reassuring them that despite the hardships they will most certainly endure, all will be well in the end. 
Once again, that's pretty much going off the motif that yes, this guy is the rock in your party. He is the light in the party. I tell you what, this guy's got some really freaking good campfire abilities. Only drawback is they take a lot of time cost. Unshakable Leader. I think this is a really good one. If you'd like him to be the center of attention, meaning he gets all the attacks, all the stress skills. Time cost of 2, which is not a lot, for minus 25% stress. I think it's an absolute, you can pair this with like a Book of Sanity or something else and really reduce any incoming stress damage. Therefore, criticals and obviously things such as like Tempting Gauntlet will do significantly less damage to him. And at least all your stress will then be allocated just to him, thus a jester where someone else will be able to heal himself or even himself with Inspiring Cry. He can essentially take care of himself if you have other damage dealers to do the damage. Stand Tall Then we get to Stand Tall. Time cost of 3, not the most. Minus 15 stress. It's not really what you're going to use it for. It's really removing that mortality debuff, which is really good. Because if you for some reason happen to get someone like an immediate death door, which can happen. I mean, it can be a giant in the weld. It can be multiple crits in a row. And let's say you're doing a boss run. Well, the mortality debuff actually kind of hurts because, you know, it reduces speed, accuracy, all that stuff. So removing that for a time cost of 3 and bringing their stress down a little bit, I don't think this can be underestimated. Zealous Speech is really good. My only complaint is it's a time cost of 5. I wish it was a time cost of 4. It does minus 15 stress among the party and then obviously does minus 15% stress as well. Like I said, I wish it was a little lower. I like the idea of it. It can be a very good ability in a pinch but it is going to chew up most of your campfire, so you do need to be aware of what you do want to do, but if this is an ability you do want to use, I think it's an absolutely great one. Just, as I said, make sure you're allocating the fact this is going to take up almost half of your campfire points. Zealous Vigil. Time cost of 4, which is like every other preventing nighttime ambush thing. Now this one's really cool, I often like to keep this one on my Crusader, even if I do have a Highwayman, Howlmaster, or whoever else in there. Because if he gets a lot of stress, I can just minus 25 stress off of himself and not worry about the nighttime ambush as well. So it's kind of a way to like recover a lot of stress but also prevent a nighttime ambush. It's kind of a double whammy and I absolutely love it for that reason. As I said many a time throughout this video, the Crusader is such a great character in the game. He may not be top tier, but I would love for him to be. He does have his rogue versatility issues, which can really put him in a pickle if the enemies in front of him are high protection based enemies. However, he can certainly be a good back row hitter if you decide to do the Holy Lance loop. He can actually be a great support person as well if you decide for him to be. He can be in the front, he can be in the back. His support positions are pretty versatile, which is really good. And I'm sorry, how can you not like the Crusader? I just like how he looks, I like the idea of him, and I like how his abilities really shine through. Thank you for watching, I hope this was helpful. I was completely biased in this review, but at the end objectively, like I said, he's definitely above average character, but he's certainly not one of the best.